accessibility and good apps. Help me welcome John Kerry. I thought I was announcing my uh, candidacy for President of the United States. I thought that's not the point. That would be a good thing. It's going to make America mad. Yeah. <laughs> Again. Again. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good. Yeah. All right. So I'm here to talk about the, I guess, the state. Let me start off with the state of Mac accessibility. Um, it was pointed out to me by a couple of people today about the fact that uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot being spoke, uh, talked about here at this particular convention uh, about the Mac and where we are and how far we've come in the last 11 years. Um, Let's see if there's a microphone. Is there a microphone? Yeah, there it is. Okay. You're making me sit and I'm not going to be able to get up again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be glad it's not the floor. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully this is on. Oh, yeah. 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 Okay, so as, as I was saying, um, I, it's been pointed out to me by a couple of people, you're not, you're not really hearing a lot of people talking about the Mac uh, as you walk around the exhibit hall, a lot of iOS stuff as far as Apple goes. So what I wanted to first talk about is just a general state of, as, as a trainer and somebody who's out there who deals with state agencies and deals with clients, where we are at as far as Mac accessibility goes since 2005 when uh, VoiceOver was first released on the Mac in um, OS X Tiger. So I was there in the beginning and to say we've come light and day, it's, it's amazing how far Apple has come with the Mac accessibility. It hasn't been the easiest ride, but then again, neither has ever Windows ever been an easy ride for screen readers and still isn't. But as far as if looking back to where we were when Tiger first came out and how almost primitive and elementary the Mac seemed back then, as far as accessibility went and comparing it to where we're on, we are now with El Capitan is pretty amazing. And as somebody who really was in on the ground level, as far as a user and then uh, a trainer, uh, it's, it's just been an interesting situation. Uh, my background, and, and I still do work in Windows going back to 1993. So, you know, all the way back to those of you who remember TSI and the Power Braille and all of that stuff, Windows 311, Windows 95. So along came Apple and basically turned the whole accessibility paradigm on its ear, uh, including the accessibility as part of the operating system and not a bolt-on third-party um, you know, screen reader, has really sort of revolutionized and, and you know, the accessibility for blind computer users and giving us an option that wasn't there. Um, what has been astounding to me and rewarding to me because I always used to make the joke when I was a vendor that I never got in on the wave. I was always the one who got, you know, the, the wave had already come and I was left on the beach, you know, when it came to the products that I was selling. And this was the first time that I was really ever in on the beginning before it even crested. And it's kind of strange because when I first got into training, and, and, and you know, oh, I'm a Mac trainer, why are you gonna do that? Nobody uses a Mac. And back then, what was I really, you know, the, the argument was really pretty valid. And I could defend Apple to the hilt, but it really didn't really make much of a difference because there wasn't anything out there to sort of prove my point. Well, like as I said, 11 years later, 2016, we're up to El Capitan, version 10.11, and Sierra coming out in the fall. And as far as I'm concerned, from having used the operating systems and the applications on a daily basis side by side, I think the, app, the Mac is just as viable a solution um, for accessibility as Windows is. And I know there's still the point that some people are gonna make, and I just actually, interestingly enough, I got an email from a potential client last night 
and he's 19, I think he said. And what he said, well, no, he's 18. He just graduated from high school. And he had just gotten, his parents got him a MacBook Pro. And his concern to me is he said his TVI was telling him all through high school that the Mac was a toy. And if you wanted to compete in the business world, you would have to you know, learn JAWS and the PC. And my response, after laughing a little bit, um, was, well, the best way I could respond to your question without being insulting to your TVI is that she should you know, get out of her time machine from 1999. It's 2016, and things have trained, changed tremendously. So from a personal experience, you know, from my personal perspective as a trainer, what has been noticeable to me the most within the last couple of years has been the fact that the proliferation of how many people have come to me for Mac training. It used to be iOS. Everything, I'd say 90% of the client requests that I got and agency referrals that I got was iOS training. And within the last couple of years, it's basically swung to the point where I would say three out of every four of my clients that I'm getting, whether privately or through state agencies, is all Apple Mac, you know, MacBook Pro, iMac, MacBook Air. And it's always a very common story. And I'm not trying to sit up here and be an Apple fanboy, but I'm always amused because I could really just write the script for the emails that I get from private clients who are requesting Mac training. And it always goes something like this. I've been a Windows user since 19 fill in the blank. I've been using the blank screen reader and I've got tired of Windows and the blank screen reader and I bought a Mac and I want to learn how to use the Mac. And it's been such a consistent theme. At first I thought it was my imagination and you know, a genie you know, uh, answered one of my wishes and I was gonna wake up at some point and realize that it was just a dream. But it's actually been growing more and more and more. And what kind of coincides with that is the fact that state agencies that even a couple of years ago that I had rehab counselors and such who would tell me, oh, we don't recommend Max to our clients because they're not used in the workplace. That has changed consistently and steadily over the last couple of years as well. And I'm seeing state agencies all over the place now that are recommending Max to their clients. Why? Because if you keep track of market data, the reality is Apple is on equal footing to Microsoft as far as the enterprise market dollars go. And that's been because of two reasons. Number one, their partnership with IBM. And you know, number two, what they call the halo effect from the iOS world, meaning people use iPhones and iPads, they bring iPhones and iPads into the workplace, the next thing you know, they're using Macs. And IBM in particular is a great example of that, where you know, it's, it's now become a Mac company which is kind of hard to believe, you know, thinking what IBM was years ago. So it's just not surprising to me that I've also had a lot of clients who now use Macs in the workplace, which was something even five years ago I never, I would rarely ever experience, where I would hear people say, oh, um, you know, I use a Mac at home, but we use PCs in the office. And I'm not saying that it still isn't out there, but, it's changing and you know I, I have a former client who's in the audience right now who works uh, for MIT and MIT is predominantly other than I think he said the more major science areas is a, is a Mac place and I've heard this story in a lot of places I have another really good friend of mine a sighted friend who the company just switched over the Macs they just dumped after Windows 10 came out and they had some kind of a disaster with Windows 10 their bosses made a sudden decision that they went all over, they just they bought a whole bunch of MacBook Pros for their sales staff. So these are the types of things that I think are impacting the sighted world, but that trickles down to the blindness world. 
which brings me to apps. I know that's the other part of the uh, presentation that I was asked to do. Now, without a, fa without a doubt, one of the biggest factors I think that is going to continue to help the push as far as uh, you know, Max being recommended and being the tool of choice is the fact that Microsoft Office 2016 is now accessible to voiceover on the Mac. So the old excuse that I used to hear, well, you don't want to get a Mac because you can't use Office. Not true anymore. Uh, you have the Office 2016, the 365, if you have the subscription, you are able to also download the Mac and use the Mac version. And as, as of the last couple of months, there is now the um, standalone version for Office as well. Is the accessibility 100% perfect? No. Not yet, but the good news is Microsoft is pretty well in tune with the blind voiceover user community and is taking this, the feedback quite seriously and is improving the accessibility with every update. Uh, I never thought that I would plunk down any more cash to give Microsoft, but I actually bought the Office 2016 uh, for $149 uh, about a month and a half ago because I was getting so many client requests and state agency requests to work with clients on using Office. I felt it was more to my advantage to, um, you know, be able to to have the you know have the experience of using it myself. So there's one major application right there. Um, so some of the other things to sort of address the more blindness, what, how am I going to replace Windows if I go to a Mac kind of uh, uh, argument or debate. So there you have word processing, spreadsheets and such. So if your job requires or your school requires that you have stuff turned in on Microsoft Word or Excel format, well guess what? You have the access to those you know, products on the Mac side. Um, OCR. For several years when the Mac first came out, one of the big arguments I used to hear was, well, you need K1000, there's no K1000 for the Mac. There's no open book for the Mac. Well, to my knowledge right now, there's at least four OCR products that work on the Mac and give you equal access. Uh, you have um, the Cyrotech DocuScan Plus version 3, you have Prismo, you have Abbey Fine Reader uh, Pro and Abbey Fine Reader Express. Um, you also have VUSCAN, V-U-E-S-C-A-N. Um, and there's one other, of course, that is escaping me now that I'm standing up here in front of you guys. I can't think of the other one, but there is another OCR product as well. So you have uh, definite access, whether it's to scanning printed material or converting PDF files that are scanned images into text. So that argument gets washed out because of the, you know, what's available out there. Um, I just found out today, and maybe some people are already aware of this, Duxbury is going to have a Braille translator for the Mac, officially released in a couple of months. Um, that was, to me, the final piece of the puzzle. The one argument that people could still throw in my face about Mac accessibility is, well, I have to run Windows because I need access to Braille translation. And there, were, there are a couple of Braille translators out there free. There's Louie, there's Braille Blaster. But having Duxbury for Mac is, to me, is, is just that that's clutch as far as now answering that question, especially when the Mac is still so predominantly used in the education field that now you have access to Braille material through the Mac. Um, I believe I was told the first beta versions or whatever you want to call it, within the next two weeks to a month will be available for uh, use in El Capitan and will be available in Sierra when it's released in the fall. So, you know, the, the, I guess, you know, I like to call that really the three major things that people used to say was, was always the the reason why you you know you would use a PC over a Mac, word processing, OCR, and Braille translation, those three major stumbling blocks, as far as I'm concerned, can no longer be used as an argument 
uh, you know, for why people should, you know, should st not go to a Mac, whether it be in the education or the professional realms. And of course, Mac applications, you know, regardless of what people think, there are plenty of them out there. They tend to be pretty accessible because of the fact that uh, COCO, which is the programming language, uh, native programming language for the Mac, is uh, got built in accessibility. Um, and also the Swift language that they're using and that can be used for both iOS and the Mac is got accessibility built in as well. So you tend to have accessible Mac applications. Uh, I remember looking for a audio book. I wanted to have an application that could take CD books that, you know, if I had like 14, like if I got Lord of the Rings or, you know, uh, Star Wars or something that was like nine discs or 13 discs, and I wanted to convert them into one file to put on my iPod to listen. And I just did a random search and, and found like three different applications right off the top of my head, you know, just a quick Google search that all could get the job done. Audiobook Builder is the one I ended up um, choosing to, to, to use. But the fact of the matter is these, these, you know, they were free downloads to try them out and they were accessible. And it just, to me, from my experience of having used Windows and dealing with Windows developers for 20 plus years and develop, dealing with Mac developers, Apple developers, it really is a big difference. And I don't know if how many people out there have had the need to contact developers in terms of, of you know, who have products for the Mac and telling them, look, you know, I'm a blind person, I use voiceover, your application needs this, that, and the other thing to be fixed. The responsiveness I've found among Apple developers is so much different. And I give Apple a lot of credit for that because they really, in the, their worldwide developer conferences that they have every June, they have workshops that are specifically geared for developers to make their applications accessible to the blind and across the other disabilities as well. So that has an overall impact. And when you get developers, mainstream developers out there, it's kind of like what's happened with iOS with people like Mark and, uh, Marco Armand and such, you know, who go out in public and beat the drum about accessibility for voiceover users. The same thing is happening in the Mac communities as well. And I can't tell you how many times I've written to developers asking about accessibility and not only are they aware of voiceover, but they will tell me in the next version or the, the two versions from now, they plan on having you know, complete accessibility. And just the, you know, the response and, and the communication that you get with a developer that I, ne I rarely ever had in the Windows world really uh, makes a big difference. And, and you know, the other side of it too is Apple products uh, software tends to be a lot cheaper. <laughs> For those of you that are considering with budgets, you know, you're paying $9 or $19 for an application in the Mac world, uh, where in Windows, it's, it's often a lot more, at least from my experience, it's been a lot more. And the last thing I, I just want to address, uh, because I've heard this spoken a lot of times for those of you who, who subscribe to the email list, such as Mac Visionaries, the, the VI phone list, uh, the Mac voiceover list, uh, you know, all of the different email lists that predominantly deal with the Apple world. It, it, it never ceases to amaze me that when there's a new version of iOS or a new version of Mac, you get a small group of people who get on their soapbox and claim that Apple has no interest in accessibility, supporting accessibility anymore. Oh, they dropped the ball. Oh, they don't care about us anymore. Well, let me just tell you something. I had the pleasure of being contracted directly with Apple for 10 months last year. And it was one of the most, and I no pun intended as a blind person, but it was one of the most eye-opening experiences that I could ever have. Not just the fact that I was working you know, with Apple, but to interact with their accessibility team and to have an address from the CEO that was specific to accessibility. The commitment in that company to maintaining and expanding accessibility, believe me, is not something that's going away tomorrow. And just because there's bugs in the next operating system does not imply, infer, or insinuate that Apple's given up on accessibility. It is the mantra 
within the company. It was one of the reasons why they contracted me to come in and, and work with them in, in the uh, Apple.com, the uh, quality assurance uh, group. So, you know, I seen that from James Craig on down through the ranks of their, you know, their, their uh, actual Apple products developers, the, the hardware, the software end of the company. It's just built, I mean, it's just a mantra that's built into their mindset right now. So I think if anything at this point, and I'm already seeing the signs of it, and for those of you who might be fortunate enough to be involved with the betas for Sierra, the next operating system for Apple, they really want to nail down voice over accessibility in the same way that they did with iOS 9 and 9.2, uh, you know, when they really ironed out the vast majority of the nagging bugs. Now, of course, there's always going to be bugs. That's just a part of software. You know, so I'm not expecting perfection. Is Apple perfect? No, absolutely not. And do I want them to be perfect? Probably not, because as far as I'm concerned as a blind person, as long as there's competition and there's a motivation for these companies to continue to expand and enhance what we have out there, that's only good for all of us. So, you know, I just want to see things get better and, and, and you know, have, when there's, a, when there's communication between a company and, and the blindness community, that, that's, I mean, you can't ask for anything better than that. And I really think that that exists. And I think Apple has really set the benchmark. And I'm not trying to say that that doesn't happen in Google or Microsoft or Yahoo or anybody else, but the record speaks for itself as far as I'm concerned for somebody who's been in this industry since 1993 as far as what, how far Apple has come in the last 11 years and why I think it's, it's a viable product out there and why I, I enjoy being a trainer. I enjoy working with iOS. I enjoy working with the Mac. So, uh, you know, hopefully I, I will be able to answer people's questions or at least assure you that things are definitely, you know, getting better in the Apple world as far as Mac specifically goes. John, I do have a question for you. Are there certain professions where you are finding it more? In um, other words, it's appearing to be more useful. Well, definitely the audio. Um, that's, that's, you know, one of the things I've experienced a lot with clients who, who work in the audio industry as far as whether they're doing sound engineering or music itself. Um, even, you know, what's been amazing to me is that data entry was always, to me, a Windows, you know, uh, exclusive club. But I've even seen companies that are using Macs for data entry. Um, I think it was the state of Vermont. I, I just had two clients who work for a specific company who are, have switched to Macs, and they just deal with, it's a lot of stuff for data entry for the state overall. So, but audio is definitely one that comes to mind, you know, and I'm not even gonna talk about video because it's not really gonna be that useful for the blind, but that's another predominantly Mac area. John, my name is Drew, and I have a real quick question, and you may have covered this, unfortunately, I did get here just a little late, and so my apologies in that regard, but uh, I have been in uh, terrestrial radio for the last several years, and a lot of software is under uh, terrestrial radio, of course, are still in Windows-based machines. <coughs> have you seen anything that is going to be coming out from Mac that's going to be used in radio that could be assisted to us as blind people in regards to uh, voice or radio? Said so I, I missed part of that question. Yeah, so have you seen anything uh, in broadcast radio world, in the commercial broadcast radio world, as far as on-air live assist automation that's going to be in the Mac? I would have to look into that. That's not an area that I've really, uh, you know, had the, had, you know, usually what happens to me is a lot of my experiences kind of get pushed and tugged in the world of, of a client coming to me and saying, this is my situation. I do this for a living. What can I, you know, how can I address this with the Mac? And that kind of pushes me down the road of having to ask questions and, you know, I know like internet radio broadcasting, like NiceCast and stuff like that, but I don't know specifically about the professional, you know, radio stations and so forth. Sure. I'd have to look into that. Yeah, thanks for your time. Mm -hmm. John, I wonder if I could say something, or you could say something actually, about um, other resources that are available, because one of the things that I found is the relatively new Mac is, the, the uh, availability of pretty outstanding materials that can help trainers 
do their job. So beyond your <clears throat> uh, excellent capabilities as a trainer, uh, could you say something about your tutorials and maybe the books that National Rail Press has put out? Uh, because I think those <coughs> brought together really provide an additional opportunity for people to learn a little bit on their own, but also to work with an outstanding trainer. Well, that, that's that's kind of, you know, it's interesting because for those of you who might be, you know, who might have come down my road as far as I started with the Mac when there were no tutorials, no manuals, no nothing. We were pioneers that kind of learned everything on our own. And as I said, you turn the clock ahead 11 years, and I, I really take issue with people who go out on public lists and try to claim that there aren't resources to assist blind people to learn how to use the Mac. And, you know, to plug myself, I, I'm not one who really likes to plug himself, and in fact, I've been accused of uh, not plugging myself enough, but I do have a whole set of audio tutorials specifically to the Mac, and I also have a set for iOS. I have 20 Mac tutorials alone right now uh, that range from $30 to $45 and cover everything from Mac basics, voiceover basics, which is free, to doing things like Skype or um, OCR on the Mac, using Apple Mail, using Safari, working with text, so I try to cover you know, the gamut as far as giving people the ability to learn all of these things if you're a self-learner. I mean, obviously as a trainer, I would like people to hire me and give them a hand, but you know, I wanted to make the audio tutorials available because you know, I've always heard people constantly say to me, well, there's no resources out there. And there's tons of them. Go to appleviz.com, A-P-P-L-E-V-I-S.com, David Woodbridge, does tons of awesome tutorials. Very quick, 10, 15, 20 minutes at the most. Uh, they have a whole beginner's Mac series. You have um, National Braille Press has, uh, has books available um, you know, for teaching you, Janet, in, in, I, how do you pronounce her last name? In, in. It, yeah, she, uh, I, I did, was, it was honored and privileged enough to help uh, do some editing uh, on, on her book for uh, Yosemite, but there, that's another great resource out there. Um, you just do Google searches for, you know, uh, uh, access, uh, you know, voiceover access for the Mac, blind, you know, anything like that, and you're going to be overwhelmed by the number of podcasts, but, you know, definitely Apple Viz, National Bell Press, and again, not to plug myself, but those are three great places to get started, and I also have the demonstrations section on my site that I linked to several other resources like Sarah Alawani and some of her stuff and, and there's other people out there as well who, who do a lot of great work. Any other questions? What's your site? www.macfortheblind.com M-A-C-F-O-R-T-H-E-B-L-I-N-D.com um, you know, it, it's a resource site. Uh, I, obviously, I'm a trainer. I, I teach, you know, Mac stuff, iOS stuff. I teach the Apple certification. Those of you interested in getting certified as a, as a AC, what they call an ACSP, uh, I do that training course as well. Any others? Okay. Thank you.